Well, happy Thursday to y'all. It's uh, Bob McCowan. It's John Shannon once again on the program. Uh, It's a little early north of the 49th parallel to be contemplating the beginning of the golf season. But every time you get a day, and we've had a few of them now with the temperature in double digits, and we're going to have a weekend apparently here of uh, temperatures in double digits. Anybody who plays golf starts thinking, I wonder how soon my club is going to be open. Well, it's probably going to be a while yet. But it is that time of year, Shannon, where you start really thinking about it. And the other thing that occurs to us is we are only a couple of weeks away from Augusta and the Masters in its regular time period. Okay, good. And, um, you know, that always, to me, in my mind, now, now we can get ready to play golf. I don't know about you. Well, I've cleaned my club six times in the last week. So. <laughs> oh, you had a hell of a lot of dirt on there all winter then, didn't you? <laughs> By the way, it won't help my swing nor my putting. So. <laughs> the golf is on the agenda today. Um, the merits of DeChambeau proofing golf courses. We used to talk about tiger proofing for a long time. Now it's Bryson DeChambeau who is the guy that everybody is talking about. And is it a problem or is everything... Okay. Ian Leggett, former tour player and winner, will join us when we continue after these messages. We are back. Yours truly, Bob McCown, along with John Shannon. Uh, We are not quite at the beginning of the golf season yet, but it's starting to feel like it. Anytime you get close to the Masters, um, I think all golfers get a little tingle and get a little excited. We just had it. Yeah, you had it six months ago, three months ago, four months ago, whatever. Mm-hmm. Now you're going to have it again. The real Masters, the April Masters, if you don't mind. Okay. And um, what we've also seen the last a couple of weeks on the tour is uh, Mr. DeChambeau um, hitting the ball out of sight um, and winning one tournament and uh, finishing in the top three in another. And it once again raises an intriguing question, I think, for all golfers, certainly for me. And that is, what is the answer to this? Um, Ian Leggett uh, joins us. He is the uh, uh, former tour pro, former tour winner, now the uh, managing general at uh, St. George's Golf Club uh, here in Toronto. Lego, is, has DeChambeau's performance just the last two weeks changed the bar at all on what the RNA, the USGA and others will do? Yeah, I think so. I, I think you look at what the impact he's having with just tour players alone. And you saw Rory McIlroy's press conference last week after the players championship and how that has influenced his play. He's talked about how it kind of got him, you know, thinking about what he did and the advantage he had at Wingfoot at the U S open where DeChambeau won and what that's done to him over the last few months in that chase for the extra yards. And it impacted his ability to play the game that he plays, uh, which is by the way, not weak by any standards. Um, I think what it's really shown us too, in the last couple of weeks, Bay, Bay Hill and the players championship is the diversity in the, in the game between the person he was competing against where a guy like Lee Westwood at 47 years old, he's got 50 yards on him on every tee shot. So I think the RNA and the USJ, there's no doubt about it. They are looking under the hood on this and how they scale this back. It is going to be a very, very difficult, um, you know, component to how they actually do that. Do they put a stop uh, date on this and, and where we go? We got to remember something though. You know, we got uh, Lee Westwood out there last week and every other player on the PJ Tour playing the same type of equipment, very much the same type of a golf ball. This has absolutely nothing to do with that as far as I'm concerned. There's no doubt about it. The game has evolved by technology with materials and, you know, the, the technology that's built into the product. This has everything to do with every other sport. Nobody's talking about 
track material or the shoes or anything that Usain Bolt runs to run under nine seconds. Nobody talks about 350 pound linemen running 440, you know, 40s now. And we don't talk about the speed and the, the of the puck and, and, you know, the amount of damage that's being done, on, you know, in the NHL, but the size and the speed of the players. And this is now rolling into the game of golf. Does he have an impact on everybody else that has a plays it? Absolutely. And it's going to show up here in probably the next five to 10 years. I would argue, well, Ian, I would argue Ian, that uh, when you bring up the example of hockey, they have changed the rules in order to allow smaller players to play the game. So they, ha they have tried to adapt uh, in order to make it more competitive for everyone on, on the ice. Uh, you, don't think that, you don't think the fact that, that he has the shafts of his golf clubs are all the same length has, has changed a lot of the perspective? No, I don't think so. In fact, I, it, I would argue there's a disadvantage to that for himself. And I would like to see him and what he, you know, how he plays the game with a regular set of golf clubs. We look at his, one of his weakest, and it's, by the way, he doesn't have a lot of weaknesses other than accuracy off the tee when you look at his stats. But one of his weakest uh, stats on, you know, within all those categories is his scrambling ability. You go into a bunker and try to hit a bunker shot with a five iron shaft on your lob wedge. I just don't see how that can actually be an advantage. So um, does he make revisions to his equipment? He's that type of person. We, we see him doing it all the time. He just saw what he did to his body. Um, is he going to do it with his equipment? It's always, he's, he's an evolution, constantly fluid, constantly searching for an advantage. And that is the component that I think that Bryson DeChambeau is going to influence the game. Tiger Woods did it. We don't see a lot of Tim Herons wandering around on the PGA Tour anymore. Um, and you talk about what the game, what hockey's done. You look at the influence that a, that a Connor McDavid is going to have on the game the speed, the way that people train, nutrition, mm -hmm. how they approach their day-to-day -day life every single day, um, you know, that, to play the game and have some form of an advantage and potential longevity, longevity in the game. Um, so we'll see where that goes. But, you know, I, I think this has just been a very, very small sample size so far. We're going to have to see where this thing plays out. Well, for many years we have occasionally watched long drive competitions there is a complete circuit for that and it pops up on television every now and then and we used to see these oversized guys with these 48 50 inch shafts um whack a golf ball 400 plus yards and we always thought well in order to hit it that far you cannot have any control over the golf ball because these guys, they take, I don't know, six or eight drives Lego, and it's not unusual for only one of them to land in the fairway. Yeah, exactly. Right? So now what we're seeing, though, is a player who has sized up, muscled up, equipment up, and can hit it 350 pretty comfortably, and as a general rule, have an idea of where it's going. And... Um, the part of this, I suppose, that concerns me is if this is a real issue in the game, um, is it more of an issue now with one guy doing it and maybe others aspiring to do it? Or is it not become an issue until there are 10, 20, 50 guys on the PGA Tour who can all hit at 350? Because I would submit that that's probably where we're headed. Yeah. Hey, 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 Bob, we're, we're already been there for quite some time. When you look at the stats on the PJ tour and the amount of guys that averaging, you know, 295, 300 plus, when you roll back the clock just a few years ago, I mean, you only had a handful of guys when, you know, Daly sort of was that particular person you had him and Freddie couples and Davis love, you had a handful of guys that could hit it, you know, over 290 yards. Um, but this has been in the game for a long, long time. I mean, you were around it. I mean, this conversation happened when Jack played the game. Mm -hmm. It happened when Arnie played the game. You know, it happened when Tiger came along. It's been a, it's been a constant conversation, whether this leads into more. But we got to remember something. There's an aspect to the game of golf that will always have a great advantage, and that's touch. The touch and feel for the game is going to – you know, be the, I, I feel is always the player that's going to last the longest in the game. And I talk about what Bryson DeChambeau is doing. He's addressing that. 
The mm -hmm. reason why Dustin Johnson is the number one player in the world is because he improved his wedge game. The reason why Tiger Woods has won over 80 golf tournaments on the PJ Tour is because he can actually hit it close from 100 yards. When he first came out on tour, he was horrible inside yeah. of 100 yards. You're right. He couldn't control the speed that he had, and he worked very, very hard on, on becoming having one of the best wedge games of anybody that's ever played. And that component of the game is never, ever going to go away. And that's why, you know, going to Shandy's point, looking at those, you know, the, you know, sort of Kevin Kistner type players on the PJ Tour, Adam Hadwins, they're always going to have their moments on tour and venues where that part of their game is going to have a huge advantage. And, hey, you talk about heading into Augusta. Nobody wins at Augusta unless they got a short game. Right. No, uh, granted, but we used to talk about course. Speaking of Augusta, we, we, uh, the phrase that was used was tiger proofing. Um, and, and Augusta literally made changes to the golf course, lengthened the golf course and instituted something that we'd never seen before. And that was rough, albeit it's mild by comparison to almost every other tour stop. But there used there was a time when there wasn't any of that. All those things have been taken into account. You know, when Jack came out on tour, it was not unusual for the PGA Tour to play 6,600-yard golf courses. Uh, 6,800 was a long course back then. Now you're, you know, we used to debate, Lego, are we going to see 8,000-yard golf courses in order to de-shambeau-proof uh, the properties? And the answer is you can't do it on most places. It, the, the limitation of land and space prohibits that. Is there any other answer other than equipment or do we just evolve to the point where a guy normally hits a par five with a drive and a, an eight iron? Well, we saw what happened at Bay Hill as that golf course dried out and sure enough, he did win there. But I think that was a, if you look at that, the leaderboard that was at Bay Hill, agronomy is going to be the factor that sort of levels the playing field here now and the firmness of greens being able to control your ball out of the rough and putting a precedence i don't care whether you're in a five iron or a sandwich putting a precedence on driving the golf ball in the fairway because of the firmness of greens is mm -hmm. going to be a key component to leveling the playing field so you take a guy like adam hadwin for instance hitting a seven iron into you know, a par four uh, from the fairway is going to have an advantage over Bryson DeChambeau hitting a sand wedge out of the rough um, and not being able to keep the ball on the green and being able to control. The one thing that players hate, tour players cannot stand, is when they can't control the ball on the ground. And this is what was always frustrating for the longest time with Americans at the British Open. That is right. a ground game. And until they figured it out, um, you know, and we talked about, I mean, one of the most incredible feats I think that's ever happened in the evolution of a player is a guy like Phil Mickelson winning the British Open. Um, but you saw that the way that Tiger Woods was able to play around Royal Liverpool and never hitting, I think he hit one three wood in four rounds when it was all baked out and dry, he just played the ball on the ground and players hate that. They like to be able to control the ball on the ground, that wind and things like that. Uh, you know, will always play factors to everybody. But I think agronomy standards and how they change that and setting up golf courses is going to be the way that, uh, you know, that the PGA Tour, the RNA, and the USGA are going to be able to control scoring. Well, what would, would we even notice DeChambeau if he couldn't putt? Would we even notice him if he couldn't hit that 90-yard wedge shot? Well, I mean, there's been players like that all the time. How many right, times? That's what I mean. you, how, how, how many times were we actually paying attention to John Daly when he was leading the driving stats by 15 yards? The only time we ever paid attention to him is when he had an opportunity to win, which mm. was very, very rare. Mm. Um, you know, he showed up True. occasionally, and that was a guy who had a great touch. He had a great touch. Well, he also had other issues that we know about reasons why he didn't show up every week, right. but. Um, you know, with that, I mean, that's always going to play a factor. But the difference between that, which is interesting to me, is the commitment on behalf of this guy. Let's, let's just not even talk about the 40 pounds he put on and the search for 30 yards off the tee and, you know, going to Bob's I mean, I mean, we may see Bryson DeChambeau showing up at the World Long Drive Championship as well as playing in the U.S. Open the next week. Who You're knows? Right. That could happen. But again, yeah. that search doesn't end right there for this guy. This guy is dedicating every ounce that he has 
And not a lot of guys are willing to do that. There's a lot of talent out there, but we've got a guy incredibly talented, taking science, and is also incredibly dedicated. You put those three together, I mean, who knows where this thing ends up? Well, those of us that play the game and those of us that are, consider ourselves traditionalists um, are, are concerned about par fives that you can hit with an eight iron or a wedge. Um, I don't know. Are you? Do you think that's okay to watch every Saturday and Sunday on, uh, on television? I, I, I don't think that's going to happen every week. The, the issue you have is, you know, the consistency of the type of venues that are, you know, the majority of PJ tour events, they're all very much the same, right? And you're not going to get, you know, you talk about coming to St. George's, you know, you get some decent rough here and you, we get a dry week where the greens are incredibly firm. Um, you're going to see a completely different outcome to a tournament where, you know, rain and wet conditions are going to to play a factor now you look at the history of the of, of augusta national for instance you look at when the scoring is under double digits so weather has impacted play the field is much more diverse compared to calm typical you know controlled uh you know environment based on that you know when weirsy won single digits when Zach Johnson won, single digits. Right. So, you know, that brings a lot of people into play where those guys, you know, the longer players on the, on tour, instead of, you know, getting up on 15 and Bryson DeChambeau dinging one down there and hitting an eight or nine iron into a par five, those conditions where he actually has to execute a four iron into that hole is much more different than, you know, and levels the playing field for a guy like Zach Johnson or even, you know, current day standards. We look at the guys like Kevin Kistner or Max Homa who are going to have to lay up on that hole. I mean, it levels the playing field when all of a sudden you're bringing all those other factors into play. Well, 13 yeah. and 15 are not factors when you're, water does not come into play when you give a guy an eight or nine iron into those mm -hmm. holes, right? <laughs> well, exactly. And I mean, we can remember days when Jack Nicholas used to hit a one iron in there and scorch it. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and speaking of Nicholas, before I forget this point, you know, when he went over to the British Open, and you're right, it's a diff completely different style of the game, and you want to keep the ball low, and you want to keep it on the ground. Nicholas's forte in his early 20s, when he emerged and became a real rival of, of Arnold, and then ultimately went over to play the British Open, he hit, didn't just hit it far, he hit it sky high. He hit his driver higher than anybody on tour, and he hit one irons that went up in the air like, like you and I would hit seven irons while well, you would hit seven irons and Jack had to learn to keep the ball down. So, yeah. you know, there's been an, I, we, I understand there's been an evolution. Let me point to this one suggestion. You can't lengthen golf courses and you don't really want to lengthen golf courses, but one thing you could do is narrow fairways by narrowing fairways. You create a greater risk for those that take the drive route. The downside is you're going to take the driver out of the hands of a lot of players on a lot of holes. And I'm not sure whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. What are your, what's your opinion? Well, I, I think you got to look at both sides of it. I mean, there, there, there's, you know, accuracy off the tee plays a precedence and so does distance. Mm. The difference though, Bob is that, like I said, is, is the firmness of greens. There's a reason why, you know, when you took a guy, you date it back to Freddie Couples and, and Davis Love. There was a huge advantage for those guys hitting eight irons out of rough compared to a guy who's also short and crooked and hitting, trying to hit four and five irons out of the rough. So it doesn't really matter, to tell you the truth. If you, if you make the, the fairways 20 yards wide and play in the hands of someone like an Adam Hadwin or, you know, Corey Connors, um, and then you take a guy like, you know, Bryson DeChambeau and, you know, Dustin Johnson, who just stand up there and try to hit it as far as they can, because they still know they control the ball on the surface because they're only hitting wedges and nine irons out yeah. of the rough. So it's when it hits the ground that they don't have any control over. So it's just, and that's what happens at a U.S. Open. You get a guys at the U.S. Open, you get incredibly firm green conditions and a precedence on driving it in the fairway where he doesn't, you know, have an advantage. But he did have a huge advantage. You're talking about Bryson DeChambeau at Wingfoot because this, the green conditions were not as firm as they wanted right. them to be. Yeah, the, the, uh, just to be the devil's advocate, you know, we see in other sports 
you know, basketball, the slam dunk, the three point play, baseball, the home run. Uh, you know, th there are times where I think in the game of golf, we, we, there's almost too much purity to say we're doing this for the golfers. Uh, you know, we got to do this for the fans. I think fans want to see the ball go far. Oh, I, 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 I see. I, I, I mean, so. No, I don't time, agree. Every, no, every time. Don't agree. D, every time DeChambeau goes to the tee and pulls out his three wood, I'm disappointed. I'm saying, well, come on. What do you mean you're hitting a, a long iron? I want him to pull out the driver and I want to hit it as far as he can hit it and pray that it's in the fairway. That's the yeah, fun. I think, that, I that, think we, people, we have to, right, there's, there's an entertainment aspect. There's an entertainment aspect to the game of golf. And, and, and you've seen this over the years. I still remember in the, when, when I was just a kid, everybody was worried after, after Arnie, after Jack, after Gary player, that every golfer was a robot. Every golfer was the same guy all the time. And, and, and they were all great golfers, but it, there wasn't any personality. There wasn't any fun in the game. You know, there, there, right now we've got, we, we do have some personalities and part of the personality of these guys is how far they hit the golf ball. Yeah. I think what's happening though, you know, I, I agree with Shani a little bit, uh, Bob. And the reason why I, I remember I was playing um, at Memorial and I'm playing with uh, Lauren Roberts. Okay. The group in front of us uh, had daily, uh, it had, um, uh, Geez, I can't remember who else. Two other, two, another player that could just hit it off the edge of the earth. So I'm playing with the best putter on the PGA Tour. Lauren Roberts goes out and has 24 putts. We probably had 100 people following us, and they had probably 10,000 people following <laughs> them. And they're just watching Daly. And Daly shoots 82. And our group collectively, and I played with Corey Pavin was the other player. <laughs> so, you know, so we got, you know, and I could hit it pretty far. I mean, I was much longer than those guys, but I wasn't in the same, you know, conversation with, with, uh, with daily, but I mean, nobody's interested in watching guys go out there and, and, and following someone around who's going to have 24 putts compared to a guy. Who can well, hit it, 20. And just to finish my thought now that television has been able, because television is a big factor in this. Now that television has been able to track the flight of the golf ball so that, you can actually see where, where it goes, you know, the, the, the you know, the, the, the Hawkeye, the, the way that they can see the trajectory and they can measure it. Um, it's more fun. It's more yeah. fun because I can't see the golf ball on television when the guy hits it out the tee, but I can see, I can see the tracking system and that's really good. And I, th I, I just, I would shudder to think that they would try at any point to minimize the long ball by narrowing the fairways. We've all seen what, what we, we all see how the players react when the fairways get narrower and everybody gets mad, uh, you know, leave the driver in the bag, it, 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 leave the driver in the bag. So, so the guy can use it. That to me is so important. I, I think too, you know, uh, going to Bob's point, I, I don't necessarily think that, you know, the, you know, I, I think what people gravitate to is the uniqueness of the player. Right. This, this was something that popped up on social media last week. And someone said, uh, you know, but some journal a golf writer had made a comment that he says that Bryson DeChambeau is the most unique player that's ever played the game of golf. Well, that's a debatable comment, but there's a lot of reason why people showed up to watch Mo Norman hit it. It sure. wasn't only because he could hit it straight. It was because he was unique. He was different. People watch Freddie couples and there are people that move the needle on the PGA tour, right? Still move the needle. Freddie mm -hmm. couples was one of those guys. John Daly was one of those guys. Baba. Bubba? Lee Trevino is one of those guys. They're all very unique individuals. Could play the game, could yeah. absolutely play the game, but they're incredibly unique. You look at, I remember playing in the U, uh, playing a practice around the US Open with Nick Faldo. Nobody followed us around. I'm playing with the number three player in the world. The guy was robotic, didn't have a whole lot to offer as far as uniqueness, and nobody's falling around. Five groups behind us later on in the day, Freddie Couples is out there and he's got, you know, 800 people following him around in a practice round. So I think that's I think why Bubba Watson was so good. To it. And going to that point, Shani and, and Bob, I think too, I'm loving the game of golf right now, primarily because of that uniqueness. The, you know, the robotic David Ledbetter, you know, sort of Nick Faldo prototypical player 
we're not seeing that anymore. And technology is playing a, playing a huge part of that. We're not talking about what happens to the golf swing. We're talking about when that face meets the golf ball and that's where technology right. is. And you look at guys like Arnold Palmer, man, guys all over the place, horrible balance, you know, it's golf swing that was all, over, but he just knew how to get the club face on the ball. And that's what we're seeing now in a lot of players. Uh, we got to take the break, but I just want to point out that uh, probably a, a tremendous reason why uh, uh, the group that uh, you were playing in with Faldo had no fan base <laughs> was less about Faldo and more about you, Lego. Well, she did have Fanny. He did have Fanny Caddy. Yeah. Oh, so there you go. I think that, that was the reason why we had a few people following us. So. Uh, we'll take the break. Ian Leggett is with us. We'll come back after these messages. Yours truly, Bob McCown, along with uh, John Shannon and Ian Leggett uh, from St. George's Golf and Country Club in uh, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, um, which will host or won't host the Canadian Open. Uh, Lego, I should get to that point before I go back a, a little bit on the, the topic earlier. Uh, what are the plans? Where are we at? It, lo it looks good for next year. We want it next year. I think it's, uh, you know, St. George's has committed two complete years to this thing and you know, thousands of hours and over 200 sure. member volunteers to committing that keep getting suspended on them. So, uh, yeah, I, I see us moving forward into 2022, a normal year, golf re-emerging, RBC Canadian Open re-emerging, people pent up to come and see live golf. And the beautiful thing about it next year, I love compared to this year, the, you know, the proximity of the U.S. Open, which is at Torrey Pines this year. Next year, it's at the Country Club at Brookline, nice and mm -hmm. close. Sure. Two similar type golf courses, old style golf courses, which I think is attractive to a guy who's deciding on what he does the week before a major championship in preparation. So I think it lends for an incredibly uh, strong field. And never mind the compassion on behalf of the players of what's happened to Canadian golf and their golf fans over the last two years of having this thing put on the shelf. It's the first time since World War II that the Canadian Open was suspended two years in a row. So I think there's a big story uh, that's going to lend itself to a pretty awesome field next year. Uh, the um, Remind me how long St. George's can play. Just over 7,000? Yeah, just over 7,000. Yeah. Which would be one of the shortest um, venues on the uh, on the tour. Do you think it would play to par 70, 71? Par, what do you par think? 70. Yeah. They, yeah. They'll, turn, they'll turn the fourth hole into a par four. So again, this is a place that, you know, just needs, needs firmness. It, you know, we can get a dry week. The greens are incredibly difficult. Uh, you have to move the ball in both directions off the tee here, which, uh, you know, it, you know, lends itself to keeping a really nice, uh, you know, diversity in the, in the type of player that can win here. So I think that that's going to lend itself to that, but Hey, I remember we played the, we played the, uh, the tournament in DC in at congressional, mm -hmm. um, one year, just the regular PJ tour event, dry, firm, fast, everything, just like you want it to be. The rough was up and I don't know, I think about 10 or 11, one under par or something like that. And then the U.S. Open happened the next year, and they grew the rough up even more in preparation of your typical U.S. Open, and it poured rain, and Rory McIlroy went out and shot 20 under par. So, I mean, you give dartboards to the best players in the world, and there is no defense, no defense to that. So, uh, One other question with regard to distance and uh, is equipment, and, you know, we've – it's kind of hard to dial back equipment. But I'm, uh, one of the things that I've often wondered about is would, I don't know whether the tour would do this or whether the RNA or USGA could, could even do this. Could they force tour players to play equipment that is not as lenient as the equipment you and I play? Potentially. Uh, it, it, I, it, I know it's feasible. It, it, you could do it. I mean, you could make them hit um, uh, Ballata balls and, and persimmon woods. But that's not going to happen. But you yeah. could you could change the specs for the tour players on their equipment and on the ball. But would they would they ever do that without without having the same impact on you know you and I and Shani? 
Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I was reading an article a couple of weeks ago on that and a, and a guy actually was talking about how he actually likes the fact that tour players play the exact same equipment that he has access to. Right. And and that's absolutely 100% true. But when I started on tour, that was not true. There was stuff I could get nobody else could get. Right. Um, this isn't NASCAR, by the way. You can't go into the Chevy dealership and get yourself an 800 horsepower you know, Malibu is not happening. So, but uh, on the PGA, as a golfer, you can get the exact same equipment, no matter what kind of, uh, you know, company you want to play with that a tour player plays with. Exactly. And a guy who was talking about the article, he says, I actually like that. I like the fact that I know I go to the tee and I can play the exact same equipment that Rory McIlroy is playing or Justin Thomas. And I can gauge myself against that. So, and, and that's the beauty of the game of golf is that I can go and play with you. There's no chance if I play, you know, I play tennis. I like playing tennis. I don't think that, you know, Roger Federer is going to look me up for a game at the club one day. Right. So because oh, there's guarantee. no handicapping, there's no handicapping in it to make the game fun and competitive for each of us where each one of you, all three of us could go to the tee with the exact same set of golf clubs, same golf ball, play the same tees and you guys can have your handicap and we can compete with each other. That's the beautiful thing about the game of golf. And we keep getting off track about guys shooting, you know, you, you know, Baltistral is irrelevant now or Riviera has become irrelevant because guys are hitting it so far. But again, you know, we talk about the, you know, what's happening in all other sports and, you know, we're evolving, simply mm -hmm. evolving. I, I love Riviera still, by the way. I think it's, it's, it's I fantastic. just think it's fantastic. Yeah. The, 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 the other great thing, and Bob and I touched on this earlier in the week, um, was to watch Justin Thomas on the weekend. Uh, so what's Justin, 26? Seven. 27? Yeah, and he's playing, so. he's playing against a guy 20 years older. That to me was, that's, that's one of the magic aspects of the game of golf is that there's still the ability of, of, of people of different ages. You can't, it's very difficult to have, I can count on one hand, uh, the amount of a 27-year-old hockey player versus a 47-year-old hockey player. I think that I can only think of two. But the fact that Westwood can do it uh, and compete and, and make, it a, make it a real match, that, that to me is one of the magic aspects of the game of golf. Well, one of the greatest moments that's ever happened in the game is the 86 Masters, right? I mean, sure. the whole world Jack. didn't gravitate around Jack Nicholas because he was winning the Masters. They gravitated around because he was competing at the age he was competing at. And that's the story around Lee Westwood. But again, we got to be on the right type of venue for that to happen. Let's not, you know, Lee Westwood's in a great headspace. And I, mean, I got a little tired of hearing that story last week. Um, <laughs> but uh, I mean, all of that is, is, is part and parcel of being a great player. When the body and mind match up, I mean, then you, you're, you're off to the races. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think they got to be on the right type of venue. And Lee Westwood is not going to compete every single week with Justin Thomas on the PGA Tour. There are venues out there that he has absolutely almost no chance unless he is playing at the absolute height of his game. Mm -hmm. And his weakness, as we show, as it showed up again on Sunday, shows up all the time. Nobody talked about the weakness. How many times that this guy has coughed up major championships on Sunday because he can't get the ball in the hole? Right. Um, and he putted much better than he normally did, but he's still the weakness exposed itself on Sunday. But that's not going to happen every week. Justin Thomas can, you know, we talk about Tiger and his A and B and C game. You know, if Justin Thomas has his B game at Augusta National and, you know, Lee Westwood has his A game, Justin Thomas is still going to win. All right. So let me ask you a question. Uh, Westwood makes what a 20 ish, 20 foot ish putt on 18 to finish second. If that he had no chance to win at that point. Right. If that putt is to win or tie the tournament, do you think Lee Westwood makes that putt? I, I mean, I don't know. Possibly, possibly. I would like to think so, just for you know. Um, well, it the speaks spirit to of the game. Yeah, but it speaks to like go to what you are implying, and that is that Lee Westwood, in both cases, mm -hmm. took a lead into the final round and just couldn't keep it um, yeah. couldn't keep it together. 
Yeah. Well, and history history would say no, right? History that, would say no. Speaking I of think putting, that's the answer. Speaking of putting, what did Corey Connors three putt on the back nine on that par five? I think it was fifteen. Um, but he had a long putt, John. Yeah. Oh, no, no, but he, but no, no. I, I'm just. But it was a three putt. It was a yeah. three putt. Um, what did what did that do? Not necessarily. I'm not worried about next week or the week after. What did it do for? Does it do for him that it what it do, would do for me? Uh, for the for the next three or four holes. Ah, uh, possibly. But I I think when you look at that, and I've I've brought this up many many times. Corey Connors, I'm telling you right now, he's getting the recognition uh, that he rightly deserves as being a incredible player. And he has yet to finish any season on the PGA Tour in the top 130 in putting on the PGA Tour. And there's a reason why we see him on TV the last three or four weekends in a row now. He's 82nd in the PGA Tour in putting, which means his stats are really dropping quickly. He has addressed the weakness. And once that weakness is no longer a weakness or doesn't expose itself as often, he is going to win a lot of golf tournaments, a lot of golf tournaments. Um, I like the way that he approaches the game mentally. He doesn't put a whole lot of pressure on himself. He doesn't get down on himself. And I think that's going to lend himself just the talent that he has to win multiple, multiple times on the PJ tour. Do not be surprised if Corey Connors wins at Augusta national, do not be surprised. Yeah. You, you know, what's intriguing here, Lego is, um, as you think back to the players who have had any level of success on the tour. The strength of Canadian players, and I'm sure it's coincidental, is ball striking. Always. Um, George Newton couldn't putt worth a damn, didn't care about putting. Um, Mo was maybe one of the great ball strikers of all time, and so was George. So was Newton. George was, yeah, for sure. Um, you look at the guys, the other guys on the tour that, uh, that are Canadians right now, Almost all of them are really, really good ball strikers. Is there is there any particular reason for that, or is that just happenstance? To it's too Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> That's my theory on it, and I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. I've had this conversation with with Richard Zokel about this. The greatest putters that have ever played the game. Okay, you look at Tiger Woods. You look at Seve Ballesteros. Um, you look at Lauren Roberts and Lauren Roberts used to tell me, I play golf with him a lot. Every time he made one, he would look at me right in the face as nice a guy as he was. He goes, I'm the greatest. <laughs> so there's a killer, there's a killer instinct to, and an incredible amount of confidence, as you know, to being a great putter and you have to put everything aside. And I really honestly believe that, and I was not very great putter. I mean, and I had no problem. I shot, I mean, I shot tons and tons of low, low scores, but putting it together, I knew that my putting was always the weakest part of my game. But for some reason, I think there's a Canadian aspect to it. That killer instinct, that confidence that you need, that you're better than everybody else out there. And I don't think a lot of guys have that. I really don't. When you look at guys, uh, you know, a Ricky Fowler, for instance, I mean, he came out on tour and he was already telling people how great he was. And we already knew how great he was, right? Uh, Nick Taylor, number one amateur in the world. How many people talked about Nick Taylor when he came out on PGA Tour? Nobody. As nobody did. Nobody, nobody did. This guy was a number one amateur in the world. No. Nobody talked about him. So no, I, I, I had a great... I had the great fortune to play with him up at the place that you and I were both members at Goodwood. And um, mm -hmm. um, I bear, I knew him only by his reputation, nothing else. Yeah. And I mean, anyway, a, I think, it's, supreme just, ball I think it's just too Canadian. And I think a guy like Corey Connors has got a little bit of a inner edge in it to him that, you know, I've always said the greatest athletes of all time, they don't like to win. They hate to lose. And right. that's yeah. the key. Oh, killer instinct. Well listen, killer, killer instinct um, is the great immeasurable of any athlete yeah the the ability the ability to just close it out one yeah. way or the other and you see it in the you see it in the greatest players in every sport yeah absolutely and i think when you look at you know, the way jordan played the game and gretzky played the game the way tiger plays the game mm -hmm. none of those people none not one of those guys ever went into the league thinking i'm going to break the record books never did it was their, their hate for losing. The byproduct of that was the immeasurable wins that they had, the successes they had, rewriting the record books. But I can tell you right now, 
Phil Mickelson loves to win. Tiger Woods hates to lose. And that is the difference between those two guys. Well said. Uh, Lego won't be that long now. Uh, do what you can to uh, speed the uh, summer weather along, will you? And uh, I let's got, get I have, I got the full round control white over that now. I got full Please. control over that. <laughs> carry, carry on. <laughs> I wish I had control over growing hair too, like you. Just, did, buddy, so. I tell you what. Just make sure that uh, <laughs> just make sure that Bob and I have our parking passes for uh, the Open in 2022. That's the key. That's the most important thing. Parking passes at the Open in 2020. I'll, I'll have them set for you right outside on Kipling Avenue for you. <laughs> <There> you <go. laughs> that, that little yellow sticker that goes into the windshield wiper, exactly. is that what you're talking exactly. about? Exactly. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, I don't, I, I don't give a flying for do about the parking pass. Uh, my limo driver won't care where he parks. So oh, really? Don't we'll worry about We'll see about that. that. <laughs> oh, please. <laughs> I've got to go now. <laughs> Lego, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks, pal. Gentlemen, great chatting with you. From uh, St. George's Golf Club, the general manager, Ian Leggett, former tour player, former tour winner. We'll come back with more after this message. <music> McCowan and Shannon with you. Uh, our thanks again to Ian Leggett for uh, joining us. A couple of things I want to touch on before we uh, move along. Uh, the Toronto Raptors have now lost, what, John, six in a row? Six. And uh, did so with um, two of their players back in the lineup. And yeah, I'll but tell it was you to it, Detroit, Bob. It was to Detroit. I get it. Well, that's my point. Is, Come on. Uh, okay, Siakam was there. Van Vliet was there. Neither one of them was in, in shape, didn't play a lot of minutes. But you should beat the Detroit Pistons, shouldn't you? If you're the Toronto Raptors. Yeah. And it raises the question, look, if they're still well within shot of making the playoffs or the play-in group that might make the playoffs. But is that where this organization wants to be? Is that what they want to strive for for the rest of this year? And it, when, you, when you ask that question and try and deduce an appropriate response, it comes down to one thing. Are you prepared, willing to trade Kyle Lowry in order to decide whether you're going to still make a run at this and whether that's important or whether you're going to focus on the future. Cause even with his contract about to expire, he has value. What would you do? Oh, I'd be, I'd be looking at the future. I would not be playing. I'm not really worried about this season, Bob. I'm worried about what's going to happen in the next two, three years in Toronto. Um, and if that, if that means I can, get something in return for Lowry at this point this team is not good you know it goes it goes back to what we talked about with Ian killer instinct this team is not going to win the NBA championship correct and, and Bobby should be worried about winning NBA championships so move Kyle along get some assets in return and start working for the future uh, in fact I, I would even I would consider moving more than Kyle because I think I think you could probably get a, a really attract Norm Powell's 42 points last night proved that he can contribute. I would suggest that if there there's a way to, to even move Powell with his very attractive contract, um, I think that's something that's uh, that's worth considering as, as well. Uh, to me, that's where this team has to be. It has to be in a rebuild mode and worried when they can come back to Toronto and sell the place out and win. Well, we're going we're gonna to talk more basketball tomorrow, so we can get into an argument there because I, I think you would, would understand that based on things I've said previously, I would try and resign Powell and I would trade Ananobi. But um, I understand there's a difference of opinion there. I don't mm -hmm. understand it, but I understand there is one. Uh, the other issue um, of note is the Toronto Blue Jays hatch pitched yesterday, had to get pulled from the game, he was pitching well, had to get pulled from the game because of... Um, um, arm pain or tenderness or whatever it is. And now you got Hatch, who I think was on his way to making the starting rotation Might have based been. on the way he'd pitched. And Pearson, who was penciled in as a starter, not going to be able to begin the season. And who knows how many innings, if any, he will pitch all year. That's been the nature of Pearson's career uh, since he's come up. Um, yes, they have depth. But the deeper you go into anybody's system, the lower the quality is it raises the question again you know during the as i read the article about hatch's performance yesterday the, the focal point was that he hit 96 miles an hour mm. is, is it not time to start contemplating pitchers pitching within themselves 
if for no other reason, not, not just because they can pitch more innings, but because there's less chance of them getting hurt. There's just too many guys. It seems to me trying to throw it as hard as they can. Well, it's, it's, it's sports in 2021, the long ball. We talked about DeChambeau hitting the ball farther. It's all about that, you know, hitting the heights. You know, what, what it does for me with the Jays is so much pressure on both Ryu and Ray to be solid starting April 1st. That's that to me is a, almost as big a story is that, you know, after those two guys, where is their depth if everybody else is a little dinged up? Well, you got a bunch of guys named who, and you got some young kids like Manoa that, you know, you don't expect them to be at the major league level at the beginning of the year. Right. You're laughing. What? Well, I just, as much as I know you'd like to have Manoa up, I, I'm, I'm wondering again, is this the year to be worried about? I mean, is this the year to be, to, to be contemplating that, you know, you're not putting people in the seats again. You know, the, I, I, maybe I'm too pragmatic about, I want them to win, but I want them right. to win with people in the seats when there's when they're generating a lot more revenue uh john shannon we gotta go we uh thank again ian leggett for joining us we'll be back again tomorrow with another program hope you'll be here to uh watch or listen to it until then goodbye everybody